Today I'd like to talk about letting go of control. Letting go of control. I believe 1 Samuel 24 will really, uh, really explains this to us. And we don't, just catching up from 1 Samuel 23, and that is uh, David was being chased by Saul. Saul almost got him just meters away and minutes away from taking his life. And the Philistines were attacking, and a messenger comes and calls him away, and Saul turns around and goes away to deal with the Philistines. Uh, and uh, God uses the irony of the Philistines to save David's life, and he's the one who's been <laughs> saving the Israelites' lives from the Philistines. And we don't hear much of what happened in these battles with Saul, because immediately Saul's intention of mind is to what? He's chasing David. Dealing with the Philistines is not his number one priority. His number one priority is this guy, this, this would-be king, this young guy who he's jealous of, who he definitely wants to um, eliminate. And so he's accused him of being the nation's number one terrorist. When Saul returned from following the Philistines, verse 1, he was told, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. By the time we get done with 1 Samuel, David will have or Saul will have explored every wilderness that's in all of Israel. <laughs> He's going everywhere. So now we're in, in Gedi, which is above the Dead Sea in some of those areas, lots of caves. And he took 3,000 of his chosen men, his best men, out of all Israel. And he went to seek David and his men in front of the wild goats rocks, uh, the, the, the savage goats or wild goats. But David was never a goat, Okay. David was a sheep, and the irony comes right here. And he came to the sheep folds, and he's looking, Saul is looking in all the wrong places because he has all the wrong perceptions and all the wrong accusations. He has built up a different image of David in his mind and in his heart. So David's over in the sheep folds because that's what he was. He always was a sheep. He's not a threat to Saul, he's not a wild goat. And there was a cave there, and Saul went into the cave to relieve himself. And so he's going to go in and um, read the newspaper. And minister, this is, uh, this is uh, an awkward moment for any pastor. Entire ministries rise and fall on how we treat this. But <laughs> Saul is going in, and it's just the irony of this that we're just like total awkward moment uh, that takes place here. Uh, as Saul could be extremely humiliated in this weak and indefensible position. And to do that, he takes off his main robe as king, and he drapes it over another rock, and David and his men were sitting in the innermost parts of that cave. I just want to pause for a second. I want you to think about what that means and the signs that David would have had. You're talking about 600 men and Saul comes in the entrance. There's no way out. And he's in the entrance and, you know, and he's using the bathroom at the front door, if you can say it that way. And what is David saying to his men? What is David like, guys, you've really got to shut up. So I'm thinking he's doing this, like be quiet and then stay firm. And then he's doing this, hold your noses, whatever, <laughs> because... We have a very awkward moment on our hands, don't we? And what do the men do? And they want to turn this around. And the men said to David, Here is the day of which the Lord said to you, David. Behold, I will give your enemy into your hand. And you shall do to him as it seems good for you. Because that's what all kings and would-be kings will do. When the enemy is there, well then... You take advantage of the moment. You take control. David, they're all pushing him to do this. David arose and stealthily, he is stealth fighter, special forces here. He sneaks up. He cuts off a corner of Saul's robe. And the robe is going to be the way that we're going to remember 1 Samuel 24. It's going to be the symbol. It's going to be our, our handle that we're going to pull to, to pick up on this passage. This is part of the king's training. I want you to see, um, I'm going to give you five, there are more. But in every passage, there's some symbol that God is using. And if you notice, they all deal with royalty. 
The first one we saw was a, a people. When David was all alone in the cave, God sent 400 people in difficulty and oppression to David, and he became their new commander. The second one that we saw two weeks back was a, a territory. He, had, he got a burden to defend the people in the city of Kela, and then he was spied on and betrayed by the people of, of Ziph, or the Zipharites, and, and the Ziphites. And from there, uh, he's really, he's burdened for the people of Israel, and some of them will, will betray him, even though he's caring for them. This is a training of the king for his territory of, of, to fight for and be a king for all the people. And then today we have the issue of a robe, and then you'll see the passages ahead. And the robe is going to be our key for understanding this. Let me add some words to it. Uh, we spoke in the messages, so you can relate to it, about the search for affirmation. And we talked about letting go of affirmation uh, and having people around doing exactly, uh, uh, strengthening us, if you will, uh, by, by looking and being shopping for affirmation uh, wherever we can get it. And then the territory, we talked about shades of skepticism. And uh, you can get those online. Today we're going to deal with the robe is going to signify the idea of control. David cuts that piece off and something happens. And, and you see, we, when we think about David in that moment, listen, Saul has slaughtered 85 priests and their wives and their children. He has eliminated entire villages in the hunt for David. David is the cause of incredible bloodshed all over the place, unjustly. David has been threatened. David has lost his home. He's lost his wife. He has lost his job. He has been running. He has been hungry. He has been starved. He's been accused. He's been lied about. Uh, he's been um, maltreated. He's had to uh, run to the enemy, on and on and on. And so David has an opportunity to go and to deal with his enemy who is indisposed in the moment right then and there. And his problems are solved. The threat's over. He has that. He has a sword in his hand. He has the enemy right there. He's just got to pull his neck back and he's just got to deal with him and take care of him. This isn't his first kill. He's done it with thousands of Philistines. So this should be easy. It's another one, and when he gets to it, he doesn't take control. He starts to feel something, so he, he chooses to cut the robe, and afterward, he feels shame. Shame in a man's heart. It struck him. It struck him deep. Instead of striking Saul with a sword, shame struck his heart after he had cut that because of the corner that he held in his hand of Saul's robe. Why? And I want to go in here because it was the moment of taking control for David. But why would he feel shame? Because if we looked at it and we said, dude, you had every opportunity, David, to take care of your main threat and you took a piece of his robe off. I'm not going to guilt you for that. You know, I could excuse you for that. Because if I were there, I think maybe just my, what, my reaction and my rage would just want to take control and just deal with it. Maybe David's did too, but there was something else that happened in that moment. You need to understand the significance of the robe. The robe was Saul's kingly authority and glory as king given to him by God. The corner of his robe is where the tassels were that dealt with the law of God. These are the same tassels, by the way, that Jesus would have worn on his rabbinical robe. This would have been the hem of his garment. The Bible talks about the wings of the garment, the wings of God's authority, and you'll see that come up throughout the scriptures. It's referring to the hem, to the tassels, to the robe, because in the tassels, there are all these references to the laws of God. All the tassels represent different laws. So here's Saul in his, uh, the robe with the color and drawing over his whole body is his glory. The idea of being, having another robe was authority, but then the idea of being under the law and with the law of God on his side would be in the tassels. David comes and he cuts a piece of all three of those things. He takes Saul's glory. He grabs for a piece of Saul's glory. He grabs for a piece of, um, if you will, his rule, his reign, and then also... He takes a piece of the 
law of God into his hand. And when he's holding that, that is when shame, or just before, even as he's taking this, that is when shame really, really burdens his heart. So we're gonna, we want to learn from this. And let's spend just a few minutes dealing with this area of the robe. Here's, here's what happens. Here's, here's what I think in, in the moment as I'm walking with David through this. And so in the last two weeks, my mind has been in this cave rehearsing this and rehearsing this. And I think as David creeps up, his, he's got 600 guys behind him. And the 600 guys are telling him, David, be the man. Be the warrior that we know you are. You've taken out Goliath, take out Saul. David, fulfill your job. David, your time is here. David, go. Come on, David. Lead us. Be the king we know you should be. Be the king we know you can be. You see what's happening? He is under extreme pressure to fulfill, if you will, his job. And there's this pressure there, and his rage, I'm sure, is, is mounting, it's growing, and he's sneaking up to that rock of where, that, where, where Saul is, and he could see the top of his head. And he's got the sword in his hand, and I think he starts to break out in a cold sweat. I would just feel that. Because as he gets closer to Saul, he doesn't just see his enemy there. All of a sudden, I think God starts to allow him to see something else. David saw his boss, his leader there, that God had put in his authority first. Then he saw his father. Don't forget, David married Saul's daughter. He was adopted from an agricultural pastoral family into the royal family with Saul. When he was adopted into that family... He, Saul became, if you will, his new father. You have to go back to the stories when Saul brought him in and said, you're no longer in Jesse's house. You come to live with me. It's, it's an adoption like Samuel had done with Saul. He saw his father, and, and he knows the command. Command five, which is, you shall honor your father and your mother. It comes with a promise to see long days, Right? Be blessed in the land. He sees a father. He knows the command. The command is, holds him up. Honor your father. But he's not honoring me. Honor your father. But he's not honoring me. He's criticizing me. And he's hating me. And he's chasing me. And he's all over me. And he's driving us into caves. He's a wicked man. He's hurting us. Honor him. He's a wicked man. Okay, wait. Then he sees, he sees God's placement of Israel's king and leader there. He's representing all of Israel here, you see. You see, if he takes Saul out in that moment, everything that Saul said about David becomes true. That he was just out for blood. And he was a terrorist and he was evil. And he's, and he's doing exactly what every other nation would do and every other king would do. In the right moment, knock out the enemy. David sees the spheres of a different person there, not just an enemy. So can I put it this way? David's goal in his flesh was tempting him, but David's God was testing him to slow down. What was his goal? His goal was to become a king. Here, here, his goal was to prove himself as a young warrior. Prove yourself. Guys, how often is it pushed on you? Prove yourself. Show that you live up to your rank. Show that you live up to what is expected maybe by your own dads or your own family or your moms. Show what it means to be hero dad. To prove yourself, ladies, the constant aspect of trying to maintain the sense of what so much pressure comes of this image, to have it together, 
to be perfect, to look right, to be ready, to be kind, not to express opinion too much, <laughs> but yet to share it when you need it. I mean, just there's so much cultural pressure. A temptation to prove yourself, to take control, to become a champion, to be awarded, to not be considered a failure. Could you imagine? You had the perfect opportunity. You were right there. What kind of warrior king are you? Are you serious? Everything you train for is right in front of you and you don't take it. You don't take the shot. Going way back to Top Gun. <laughs> You're considered a failure. And there's a fear in there and there's where shame comes in to eliminate his main threat and make life easier, to take a shortcut, to seize the throne, to have the opportunity, to get the upper hand, to one-up the enemy, to take advantage. Here's another one. To hit back, finally, for what he's been doing to you. To criticize back, to call back, to hit back, to pay back. You see, friends, taking control or demanding control, think about it is often a reaction in the moment. A moment of stress and a moment of anger. When we feel we have to fight back. Why? Because we feel like we're blocked. Our goals are blocked. Our storyline is blocked. Somebody's made, our comfort's blocked. Our functional saviors aren't saving us. So we have to fight. And so we reach for it. We reach for control. We reach for the robe. We have unmet expectations in life. We have unrealized dreams. We're supposed to be living the dream and it's not happening. So we reach for it to take control. Somebody's stopping us from that. We feel maybe imperfect. And we keep feeling the nagging aspect of all of our weaknesses and all of our, all of our limits. And our limits torment us. We feel too weak from anything spiritual, emotional, or physical hindrance or handicap, we reach for control. Sometimes we feel at a loss in one area of our life, and we're like, we can't fight back there. We're never going to win it. So what do we do? We pivot to another area of our life, and we fight there. And so we're venting into a whole other area. We're bleeding out in the whole other area where we would never win in one area that we're upset about. See, we, it's reaction. We reach. We want a better and a calmer life, don't we? We reach for it. And we think we know what's better for us to get it. <laughs> so friends, guys, when we feel that outward pressure, like 600 people in the darkness in the back of the cave, 600 voices in the back of our minds all talking to us, be this way. Do this. What's the matter with you? How come you're not doing this? How come you're doing this? Etc. We will naturally always reach for what protects us or satisfies us the most in the moment. That's our temptation. We'll reach for it every time. Why do I know this? And how can I tell you this? Because that's what Adam and Eve did. They, were, they had no sin, no problems, and only one command. And what did they do? They reached for the one single thing that pleased their eyes, the fruit. And we're all sons and daughters of Adam and Eve. And what does that mean? We will reach against God every single time. We will. And that is what it means to retaliate. That is what it means to feel like I in my... When shame hits me inside, when guilt, when pressure hits me inside, I have to reach for something to protect myself, to keep the image up, to not be considered a failure, not be considered weak, and definitely don't be vulnerable to others. But friends, we must see through the temptation. And the temptation is to take shortcuts. The temptation is to take the kill. Because on the other side of that is a trial, a test. And the, on the other side of the test is we work through the temptation. We say no to the temptation. We work through the test. There is the glory and the growth of our character. 
there is God and his presence there. He's waiting for us to come to him. Here's the question that we have to ask ourselves. I think this begs the question. When do you hit the brakes? Seriously, when somebody presses your button and inside all of a sudden comes the rage, the judgment, the criticism, the whatever, when do you hit the brakes? What does it take? Right? Because if you don't hit the brakes, you're going in full speed, and what are you going to do? You're going to take Saul out. You're going to reach for whatever you can to protect yourself and take the easy way. What do you do if you live in Christ, and when is it? What's the point when you hit the brakes in life and go, hold on, there has to be another motive for what I'm doing right now in this situation. I just want you to reflect on that. The breaks in this question means that we are cultivating responses and reactions that are according to the Father's will and not our own will. That's what the breaks mean. The breaks slow us down to go, God, what do you want from me now? Not what do I want and I'll take from you now. Even if it's little pieces of the road. And what's happening in the time when we're going through a trial like that is we're training ourselves. Get this. We're training ourselves to release control to the Father. To release control of the Father and allow retribution to come from Him so He writes our story. So we're not paying back. We're not hitting back. We're not insulting back. Or another way that we do it is we distance ourselves back and pretend they don't exist. So that's what the whole part of this is all about. Today is I want to talk to you about letting go of control and in place cultivating childlike faith by letting go of control and that reaction of taking, taking the life or taking the robe, etc. What I want to do is say, I want us to come into a vulnerable place of childlike control. Think about a child. And think often of what Jesus did. I think, think of the trust a child has. The question is, will we trust the Heavenly Father? Here's another question. Will we be loyal to the Father first and foremost even if that means someone is using the bathroom on our front door of our lives. You know what I'm saying? Even if that means somebody's threatening us and leaving their junk behind. Jesus, what did he do? He lifted up a child on a number of occasions, and he said it this, in this way, paraphrased. You big people, you need to have trust like this little person. <laughs> You big people who can hear me have trust like this little one. So the question comes back to us. Is our heart soft enough to say yes to him the very first time? When an opportunity or a negative circumstance arises. Is our heart soft enough to say yes to him and recognize him when the pressure is on? Or when the fear or the feeling of shame rises up in our hearts. Reflect. Do we go to the Father first or do we talk about him well afterward? Yeah, he just worked it all out for me. Do we go to him first? Is he even on our mind? Or does our rage overtake us? Our anger? Have we, watch, have we developed the habit where it is our shtick, our gig, to always grab for the anger, the rage, or the shame and try to take control. Is, it that our, is that our habit, to just try to take control of things? And then maybe later talk to God about it and say, I'm going to do it first and ask forgiveness later. That's not a Bible verse, by the way. <laughs> that's kind of how, how we go with things in life, don't we? Guys, the world around you will scream at you when you wait for God, that you're a failure. 
The world says, if you feel like it, do it. Go after them. You don't deserve to be treated like that. That's what the world says. You go back after them. You retaliate. They will call you a failure. And that shame will rise and you'll drive into more control. Friends, they did that to Jesus as he hung on the cross. If you're the son of God, get off the cross and save yourself. You failed king, king of the Jews plastered up above him. But the actual opposite is what's true. Why is it true? Because when you approach the true heavenly father and you give space to him, you have allowed, given vengeance and retribution to him. And that takes more strength. And it takes more courage to wait for him and give it to him so that you are acknowledging that you have a greater king and a greater authority over your heart than you and the little voice that's nagging inside. You're letting the father write your story. Now here's David. He feels shame for simply cutting a piece off the robe of, of cloth. Now, that's childlike sensitivity. Everyone else wanted David to kill Saul, and we would all excuse David for simply cutting off a piece of the robe. He's been through hell. But David knew what that meant. He wouldn't even touch the Lord's knowing it, and he came too close. So let me ask you again. What do you do when your worlds collide? Because isn't this the worlds that David had? He had his work, being a commander, being a warrior, being a leader, being a future king. He had his family. Now, well, there's his father-in-law right there. And then he had his faith because he has God's authority over that king because that's a robe he's touching. There's only one robe like that. What do you do when the dreams or the shame or the criticisms come through one of these avenues? What do you do now? When your worlds collide. Let me ask you this then. What should you do when your worlds collide? And this is the priority. That's why I switched up the order. So even if you have a family member who is hating you, there is still Christ and God the king over you. You see? God must have first place. Because if we put any one of the other two, family or work or our calling, and that can be mothering and parenting, and we put any one of those two up above that first calling of faith that I am in Christ, if you're in Christ, that's your champion. He's covering me because if you put any one of these other two up above it, you'll go through that and you'll reach, you'll reach for the story. You'll reach out. Not against Saul, but against God. Because isn't that what David was doing? Who gave him that robe to begin with? God. God is overall. I want to tell you that some of the deepest areas where we feel shame and torture inside is because we've really been active reaching for a life that's outside of what the Lord's given to us. Or inadequate. What should you do when your worlds collide? Go to God. Put the brakes on and work this out. And don't sacrifice your work, excuse me, your family for your work. Don't put your family on the altar of work either. <laughs> That's a temptation as well. David goes to the back of the cave. His men, they're upset. This is the second mention of the word tear in this, in this chapter. The Lord forbid that I should do anything like this to my Lord. The Lord's anointed to put out my hand against him because he is God's anointed man. So David persuaded his men with these words. The word persuaded means he tore into them. It's the word, same word that he used when he tore and cut off the piece of the robe. Fascinating word play here. He tore into his men for thinking that they or he could reach out against God. What was David doing? He was putting faith above work with others. Now that's a good leader. 
He did not permit them to attack Saul. And Saul rose up, good for, thank goodness, and went, left the cave. <laughs> he went on his way. Afterward, David was not going to pocket this piece of robe so that he could strategically bring it out when he comes and does a vendetta or, or <laughs> does some kind of strategy later. He wasn't going to play with this piece. He was already feeling the burden that he had it in his hand, and immediately he's going to confess David is going to go do something counterintuitive and countercultural. He arose, he went out of the cave, he calls after Saul. My Lord, the king, notice what he does. I first recognize your authority. Do you see that? This is what stopped me. You're the king, but you're my king. And when Saul looked behind him, look what David did. He bowed with his face to the earth and he paid homage. That's humility, isn't it? He bows. Look at his position. He's not looking at his enemy. He's looking at the ground. He's worshiping. He's, and they would pay homage often by blowing kisses up. Or the idea of blowing kisses up. His face is to the ground. His arms are coming this way. Who has the advantage now? Who has the advantage? Saul. Saul could run back and kill him while he's paying homage. And David would have bowed right there and allowed him to, probably. <laughs> Called his men in. He paid homage with humility. In other words, David has gone vulnerable. Because David is seeking something else. He's seeking that the Father will orchestrate something that he can't obtain on his own. A connection back to Saul. And David said to Saul... Why do you listen to the words of men who say, Behold, David seeks your harm? There weren't men that were saying that. It was Saul saying it. But isn't that nice of David to say, You're getting bad intel? You're getting bad info? Saul, don't listen to those other voices. But it's really Saul's heart that's wicked anyway. And I think it's a kind phrase, gesture, that David's not pointing or accusing him. Because David takes Saul to court right here. He's going to have a court out there. And David takes him to court, and he's just not accusing him out of hatred, but he's, he's identifying the problem out of respect and honor. Behold, this day your eyes have seen how the Lord gave you today into my hand here in the cave, and some told me to kill you, but I spared you. And I said, I will not put my hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. See, look at the language. See, my father, see. Do you see the peel going here? First he said, my lord, the king. Now he sees this is family. I want, he's appealing to him vulnerably as in that relationship. He says, I don't see you as an enemy. I see you as father. Do you see it? Do you see that I see you as father? See, my father, see. He implores with the peace. The corner of your robe is in my hand for by the fact that I cut it off and didn't kill you. Now you may know and see that there is no wrong or treason in my hands. I have not sinned against you. Though you hunt my life to take it. He's giving the robe back. He will give it back to him. But he does it as an evidence. He enters the robe into evidence in the case. Why do I say that? Because this next verse is key. May the Lord judge between me and you. May the Lord avenge me against you, but my hand shall not be against you. Who's in control? Whose hand is in control? David says, my hand's down. God's hand is moving the situation. God is here. He'll judge. This is what it means to let God take control and that David would serve him. I know there's that phrase out there that says, let go and let God. There's more to it. Yes, let go and let God, but then go and serve God as he does it. It doesn't mean just check out and do nothing. <laughs> it means approach. 
let go, let God, so that you can have a new connection and an open door. Show him what Christ has done for you and how he's covered you so that you can come back without retaliation. You put your hands down. You don't take control so that maybe, possibly, as the Lord would orchestrate the story, either uh, avenging would take place or an open door. As soon as David had finished speaking these words to Saul, Saul said this. Look at the wording. Is this your voice, my son David? He doesn't call him an enemy. Do you think Saul saw who he really was? I think so. And the reason is because look at his reaction. And Saul lifted up his voice and wept. Saul has these moments where his defenses crumble. His opinions about David fall. David's name means beloved. Saul sees beloved, the beloved one of God there. Saul has these moments where he's a prophet because he was adopted into the school of prophets. He was adopted in Samuel's house. Samuel was a prophet. Saul is here prophesying, but he has to weep first. What has happened? David, I love this. David did not stick a physical sword into Saul's heart that day, but with his words of kindness and with his attestation of evidence, David plunged words of love into Saul's heart. And Saul lifted up his voice and cried because he saw a son now, not an enemy. An absolutely beautiful occasion. And he said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have repaid me good, whereas I have repaid you evil. And you have declared this day how you have dealt well with me in that you did not kill me when the Lord put me into your hands. Here's the countercultural aspect. Every would-be king would kill an enemy. And here's what he says. Watch. For if a man finds his... What's the word there, everybody? A little bit louder, just so I know you're still there. Enemy. Enemy. It's amazing how much of you, you can hide behind masks that you're wearing right now. (laughs) Just so that I know that you're still there. Enemy. What man, when he finds an enemy, will he let him go away safe unless he sees more than an enemy? So may the Lord actually bless you and reward you. May the, not the vendetta, but the recompense, the reward will be good for what you have done to me this day. And now, behold, here's where he prophesies. Exactly what Jonathan said in the last chapter, I know that you shall surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel shall be under your control, established in your hand. David didn't seize it, God granted it. Just like Jesus, when he came down, he did not seize the control of the authority of God in heaven. He saw that the, that the greatness of God and the authority of God and the power of God was not something to be grasped, but he made himself a servant. And boy, that reminds us of David. And David reminds us of Jesus. And so he makes himself a servant and he comes down and he, he's born in poverty in caves right near En And look what Saul asks. Swear to me, therefore, by the Lord, third mention of cut, tear, that you will not tear off, cut off my offspring after me. If you didn't kill me, please don't kill my kids. And that you will not destroy my name. If you didn't take me out as king, that you will not destroy my name from the land of Israel, from my father's house. You see what he's saying? I see the family aspect here that God's giving, given to you. He goes from God rewarding him into his family and into his job. And David swore this to Saul, and Saul went back to his work. But David and his men went up to the stronghold because they're no fools. <laughs> What happens when we're vulnerable like David? 
David was more courageous and more brave in that moment to be vulnerable and to bow down than to take vengeance in his hands and to make Saul fall down. David risked his life to move towards Saul. Do you see that? Instead of killing him and running away, he moves towards Saul, but he did it in the form of a son who was not trusting his earthly father and what his earthly father might do in response, but his heavenly father, so that he could connect with the heart of an earthly father. Possibly, some way, maybe the Lord would open that connection so that he would see that I don't mean him harm because God is guiding me. See? I won't take it in my own hand. This is deeper faith. This is deeper discipline. This is David with brakes on. This is David with godly character. This is David that won't listen to the voices of culture or colleagues. <laughs> this was love. David went out not to, not to act in vengeance, not to run up from behind Saul and kill him, but to open a door and connect in his heart again. It was an act of love. Who does that? Who does that? I notice no one's raising their hand. I'm not raising my hand either. <laughs> but we should. Why? Because the king who is greater than David, David risked his life, but Jesus came at the cost of his life and did this. I'll tell you who does that. It's the Lord Jesus. You have heard that it was said, Matthew 5, 38, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Pay back, hit back. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. It sounds like Saul. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, they're going to see three actions here that are good actions and also surprising ones that are not expected in culture. Turn to him the other. Let him hit you on the other side. Oh, that would be strange. Yeah, because you're not going to retaliate. You're going to give out of love to say, I don't mean you harm. And if anyone would sue you and take your tunic... Well, give him your outer garment as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him too to meet his need and beyond. Give, give to the one who begs from you. And do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. You see, Jesus is standing on the, on the mountainside at Galilee with hundreds of people who are also in difficulty and oppressed, oppressed by Romans, oppressed by, by Pharisaical leaders oppressed in their heart by sin. And David is standing there, sorry, the new and greater David, Jesus is standing there preaching to them about what does it mean to be a new people like uh, that are my people? What will it be for you to do the impossible with me inside? And that's the only way that you can do the impossible. He says, you have heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and you shall hate your enemy. So there's nice boundary lines. But I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. So that you might be, everybody? Sons of your Father who is in heaven. Why will you love enemies? Why will you pray for those who despitefully use you and persecute you? So that you develop the character that looks like God, who wants to channel love back through you into a world that hates each other. So you look more like God. You will be sons. You see, a son took on the characteristics of the father so that you might show that there's a father who lives with a family. That people won't be your enemies any longer for he makes us look what god does here's the characteristic he makes the sun rise on the evil on the good he sends rain on the just and on the unjust for if you love those who love you big deal do you not even do that do not even tax collectors do the same thing those are the most hated people in all society but they'll do that that's not what your heavenly father does if you only greet your brothers what more are you doing than anybody else the gentiles will do that you, therefore, must be complete. You must look like your Father as your Heavenly Father is perfect. That's the word, complete. You must grow into the image. You must stop seizing control. 
let go of control to become like a child. Childlike faith says, I want to become like you. How do I do it? I love enemies. I pray for them and I do good. I, I give away what I think is rightfully mine, even, and I don't retaliate. And you know what you'll say? It's impossible. That is really hard. And I say to you, you're exactly right. It's exactly impossible to do. Unless. Unless. The deeper motivation that drives you is a motivation that, of the love of God that he has for you. And that you remember that you were his enemy first. And that he loved you from the cross while you hated him. If you can put yourself back in the time when you were his enemy and when he came and saw more of you, more about you, and he saw you not as his enemy anymore, but as a child, and then as his treasure, and then as his mission, his, his bride, then you'll have the love that motivates countercultural and surprising things toward those who hate you. We can't be vulnerable and can't have humility, though, if we're still gripping little pieces of cloth from the past against somebody else to pull out at the right time. Kind of like trump cards in our card games. <laughs> if we're holding it against them and we're still gripping these things that we think are rightfully ours and we're looking for ways to get back retribute or to be paid back, listen, You've got to lay them at the cross because that's exactly what Jesus did on the day when his royal robes were torn. King David himself prophesied about this. He prophesied about the day when the royal robes of the ultimate king of kings would come down and they'd be torn in four parts, signifying his love would cover the globe. They divide my garments among them and for my clothing they cast lots. They'll betray him. They'll tear him apart. And he let that happen. He was ultimately vulnerable. His royal robes were seized and cut in pieces so that all of the retribution, all of the things that were supposed to be meant for us could fall on him so that all of the love that pours from the cross can fall on us and so that none of the retribution can come off of us and onto others. The retribution that we're passing around in little ways to our family members and to our friends and to our colleagues and to this world around us. Jesus bore the shame. Jesus covered the shame. He is our model for love. He is our model for trusting the Father like a child. In childlike faith, he was nailed to the tree. And now you can love your enemies too. Because you can. Because the royal king was vulnerable in your place for you. And he empowers you to do that. That is the one who loves. And if he's in you, then he's driving you to love in the same way. May you cultivate childlike faith.